Good morning, good morning. Good morning. So glad to be with you all today. Um, looking into uh, finishing up this chapter of the book of John. I was thinking this week about what we have coming up. Um, we have Easter coming up pretty soon. And I am so excited to be able to share. And we have Good Friday coming up. And... I'm so excited to share this, uh, that time with you. I'm really looking forward to it. And so um, as we anticipate Easter coming um, and as we focus our mind on that time, um, I invite you to, to invite your neighbors, invite some friends to be here with us on Easter morning so that we can, we can share about the resurrection of Christ, the hope that we have in this world. And so... Um, I'm looking forward to that time. But today, we're going to be in, in John chapter 3, verses 22, all the way through the end of the chapter in 36. John chapter 3, 22 through 36. Before we get to our text, though, in the past few weeks, we have seen how in the Gospel of John, we've seen three ways in which Jesus fulfilled or surpassed Judaism. If we remember in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, Jesus provided new wine, and that vastly surpassed anything that the contemporary Judaism could offer. It rendered obsolete the stone jars of purification. He demonstrated the new time of abundance at the wedding in Cana. In chapter 2, verses 12 through 25, Jesus indicated that he was the new temple, that he was the new way, the new mediator between God and man. And then last, uh, last, over the last two weeks, in, verses, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, Jesus fulfills the prophecies from the Old Testament of water and spirit regeneration, and then he proves that his death is the ultimate antitype for the snake lifted up in the desert. And now today, we're going to be looking in 22 through 30 and showing how Jesus surpassed John the Baptist and that any baptism or rite of purification that John the Baptist may have represented. In other Gospels, we see that that Jesus talking about John the Baptist in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 7. And Jesus said that among men, no one was greater than John the Baptist. That's high praise coming from, from the Messiah. Amen. Jesus said this in a time when John was in prison, about to be executed. He said that even in heaven, the lowest is that John the Baptist is greater. It's, wow, greater. The title of my sermon today is The Goat, Greatest of All Time. We think about that, and depending on what sports team you follow or what sports you like, your answer, if I asked you, who is the goat? Who is the greatest of all time? Some football fans will say, Tom Brady. Uh, okay. Me, I remember growing up, and I was too young to watch his fights live, but I loved watching Muhammad Ali fight. And if you asked him, in his prime, who the greatest was, his answer was easy. I'm the greatest. His whole thing was, he said he was the greatest. He would call the round he would knock someone out in. He would beat him so bad that if the person was like, if he said they're going to fall in eight, and in that seventh round, they wouldn't get off the stool. They'd be like, no, I know he's about to knock me out. He's been playing with me. Greatest fighter of all time. Maybe you like... Tom Brady or Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith. We all have that person that pops in our head as, oh, they were the, the greatest. LeBron James. 
I'm sure we can all think of someone like that. Maybe you can even think of someone at your workplace or your school who thinks that they're the greatest. And if we're honest, when we encounter people like that, we kind of hope that they'll lose. I mean, as much as I love watch, loved watching Muhammad Ali fight, many people in that time were waiting for him to fall. They wanted him to fail. I mentioned a few weeks ago that I played high school basketball and that I wasn't very good. But there are a number of guys on the team who were actually very talented players. Uh, one of them, his name is Brandon. He was good, and he knew he was good. And so he didn't think he had to listen to coach. Coach would always tell us, follow your shot. You know, go for the rebounds. And Brandon would shoot and be like, you know what, it's going to make it in. I don't even have to watch. So I was one of the people that coach would sub in for Brandon to punish him. Be like, you're not going to listen to me? Yoki, you go play then. And then Brandon would have to sit there and watch me not do well. And be like, okay, coach, I promise I'll do better. And then he'll let him back in. I hated watching Brandon play. And secretly I wished that he would miss his layups, that when he was at the free, free throw line, that he would just brick it. You see, even though I knew that the better he did would be good for the team because then we would win, I'd rather have lived with him doing poorly even if we lost. I was so focused on what I wanted that I failed to keep focused on what was best for the team. You see, I, I had a misplaced focus. And as we look at our text today, we're going to see this misplaced focus among the disciples of John the Baptist. And John 3, 22 through 36 says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John was baptizing in Ainoanim near Salim because there was plenty of water there. People were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who is with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him. John responded, no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all, and the one who is from the earth is earthly and speaks of earthly in earthly terms. And the one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. For the one whom God sent speaks God's words. Since he gives the Spirit without measure, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. The one, whom believe, whom, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to, to read your word. We pray, God, that through the distractions of the week, of the day, through times of sorrow, through just, Lord, times that can be hard. Lord, we ask that you will help us to set those aside now so that, Lord, we may seek your face, so that we can learn, Lord, from this passage 
what it is you would have for us to learn. Lord, I pray that you will speak through me. I pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I hated watching Brandon play. You know, I'm going to look him up. I hope he's doing well. I hope he's doing well. Surely that type of jealousy isn't seen in ministry, right? I mean, we don't see that type of jealousy in, in churches. But we do, don't we? I mean, here we just read in the Gospel of John, you have John the Baptist, who has spent his entire life in ministry proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. And you have John and Jesus both operating in the same area. And John's disciples get jealous. We see that as they were baptizing, John's disciples got in, in, a, in a dispute with with a Jew about purification. Now, more than likely, this dispute was about whether Jewish purification laws were still needed to be kept since John was baptizing and Jesus were baptizing. We can draw this out because the question that John's disciples came to John the Baptist about doesn't seem to follow from the dispute. In verse 26, we see that they came to John and they told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about, who, the one who is with you across the Jordan, because apparently they thought John the Baptist might have forgotten. He spent his whole life testifying about the Messiah, and they felt they needed to remind him. They said, they're baptizing over there, and everyone is going to see him. We're losing our people, John. How are we going to fund our ministry? What about our popularity? People from miles around were coming to you, John, and now they're going somewhere else. Isn't it amazing how quickly John the Baptist's disciples forgot what they were supposed to be doing? They quickly turned a dispute about, about ritual purification into a session of complaining about the success of Jesus and his disciples. How quickly had they forgotten the message of their teacher? They addressed John the Baptist, rabbi, which means teacher. John, John must have been shaking his head. He said, you're calling me a teacher? I've been teaching you all these years, and you've missed my message. We remember John's message from chapter 1. He would have preached that message day in and day out. The Messiah is coming. Make straight the path. Clear the way. Repent. Be baptized. You know, they've forgotten. And, and we, we need to learn from them. Because it is far too easy for Christians nowadays to have that same attitude that was shown by John's disciples. And it's very damaging to the mission of the church. It's very damaging to, to Christianity, and it's contagious. It's contagious when we have that jealous attitude. Few things gives the enemy such an occasion to, to undermine the church as when we are jealous over the success of other churches and other Christians. You see, we are not called to be that church down the street. We're not called to be that mega church with their 10,000 people. But we are called to point people to Jesus, not to worry about the success of others. There are people who we will interact with. There are people who, who will talk to us who wouldn't talk to anyone else. That's our responsibility. That's our mission. It's not a comparison. 
we're on the same team. When they win, we all win. But John, the humble servant. My second point is the humble servant. John, the humble servant, speaks. John starts by reminding them in verse 27 that all gifts come from heaven. See, people were flocking to them to be baptized and to hear the proclamation of the coming Messiah. That was a gift from God. That was, that was God, God said, I am gifting you with this mission. I think about the missions that, that God has, has set for me. I, I remember years ago thinking, God, this is what I want. I, I want X. And God said, how about you're faithful in Y first? I said, well, no, no, no. <laughs> but God, that's not what I want. I want the bigger thing. And he said, no, I need you faithful here. But this person has, I don't care about that person. Where are you serving now? Are you faithful there? Are you, are you spending your time and your energy there? Or are you spending your time and energy angry that someone else is doing what you want to do? And here we have John looking at his disciples, saying, our ministry up until this point was a gift from God. Are you going to be angry at God now that, that our service in this area is done? Often we think, if God is done with us here, he must be done with us completely. But that's not the case. These disciples had missed something. Because when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And his disciples said, Oh, we're going with him then. Except for some of the disciples. Not judging them too harshly. Because John still had a mission. There were still people looking for John. And John still needed to direct them to Jesus. You see, from time to time, we all need to regain a proper focus. And John does just that with his disciples by reminding them who he is and who Jesus is and what the goal was. John starts by reminding them that he was not the Messiah, but only the herald sent before him to prepare the way. I love how, how he says that, how he says, you yourself can testify. You might like, you've heard me say this before. I'm not the Messiah, but I was sent ahead of him. John gives this beautiful image in verses, in verse 29. This beautiful image of the groom and the church. Throughout the New Testament, there are many passages that talk about the church, believers, being the bride of Christ. And here John is bringing that in pretty early in the gospel. We see it a lot more later. That's when I've got a, on April 1st, my brother's getting married. He says it's not an April Fool's joke. I'm hoping not because a lot of people have bought tickets to fly in for the wedding. So if it is an April Fool's joke, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> it'll ruin families, but it'll be awesome. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to, to officiating his wedding. I'm looking forward to, because I'm remembering when I got married, and I was standing at the front of the church, and the back doors opened, and, and my bride stepped in, and I looked at her, and I was just like, I can't believe this is happening My best man, standing there, my brother was my best man. He's standing there. Do you think he was angry with me? Like, how dare he be happy? How dare he be joyful and excited? Oh, can't believe. No, that's not what a best man does, is it? And that's what John tells him. He says, 
But the groom's friend, who's the groom's friend in this story? John the Baptist. The groom's friend who stands by and is listening for the groom to be coming up so that he can what? So he can rejoice greatly at the groom's voice. The groom's, that best man is excited to see the look on the groom's face. Here is your bride. And that best man, his whole purpose, according to John here, when he sees that, that is what makes his joy complete. All the work the best man had put into it, all the planning, all the organizing that had happened, his joy is complete because finally the groom and the bride are together. In verse 29, it says, so, that, so this joy of mine may be complete. That joy that John is pointing to is the fact that people are now flocking to Jesus. He's like, this is what I've been wanting. I didn't never wanted people to stay with me. I've always been pointing to the groom. In verse 30, we have the final words of John the Baptist here in the Gospel of John. Final words are important, aren't they? And here, the Apostle John listed these final words. We know in Luke, that John had a couple other words that he sent through his disciples while he was in prison to Jesus. But John places this here for a reason. This is a focus. When you read through the Gospel of John, and so far we've had a number of references to John the Baptist in these first three chapters. And you continue to read and you realize John is all gone. He's done. What, what did he say last? He must increase, but I, I must decrease. Not only is that statement a recap of verses 22 through 30, but it's a summation of John's entire life and ministry. Rarely do we celebrate decreasing. Rarely do we celebrate fading away. But maybe we should. Maybe we should celebrate it when we're fading away for the right reason. I remember when I was younger, we'd have those, uh, those balloons you can make balloon animals out of. And so we would blow them up, and when you squeeze a balloon in one area, all the air goes to another area, and then you squeeze it back, and if you, you and your brother are fighting over it, then it pops. But that's right at the point. We all know that, right? When you, you squeeze it, and it's like, whoosh, this part decreased, so that the balloon above it could increase. One part had to get smaller for the other part to get bigger, and John knew this. When I was working for a, a musical, um, I worked behind the stage, I don't sing or dance, behind the stage for a musical version of Bonnie and Clyde. Um, I'd never been part of theater before, and if you've ever been a part of theater, then that's an interesting group of people. And I learned so much, and this was an amazing play I enjoyed being a part of. I had friends from church who were actors and actresses in it, um, it was put on by a local theater company in Albuquerque, and it was, it was great. And I'm noticing how much work each and every person put in. There are people who they were putting in a lot of work, and they never even spoke a line. They were, they were back here somewhere. Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, you guys probably know the story. As I thought about that play while I was preparing my sermon, something dawned on me. Everyone in that play, every single person in that play, their job was to place 
the actress who played Bonnie in the limelight. Every line, everything that was done was to focus everyone's attention on her. Now, without them, it wouldn't have worked. They were, they had to be there. I had to be there to make sure that the, the firearms that we're using with blanks in it were used safely and no one was injured. That was my job. Apparently, I also had to be there to carry the cast iron tub on and off the stage upstairs. I didn't sign up for that, but I was there to do it. And without me, it wouldn't have gotten done. We were all there. Everyone had a role that they needed to fulfill to focus everyone's attention on the character of Bonnie in the story. That was John. That was what John was trying to tell his disciples. Your job isn't unimportant. It's actually very important because when you do your job well, people will notice Jesus. Amen. This is the same attitude the Apostle Paul had when he was writing to the church of Philippi. You see, at that time in, in Philippi, there were people who were, who were going around and they were preaching the gospel because they wanted money. Some were preaching the gospel because they wanted fame. And people were getting upset about it. And apparently people of the church of Philippi had, had written to Paul and said, you need to stop this. Come do something. And then in Philippians 1.18, Paul writes back and he says, let me ask you something. He says, what does it matter only that in every way, whether from false motives or from true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Paul had learned something, probably from the story of John the Baptist as well. He had learned that if it's pointing to Christ, then what does it matter? John was like, our ministry is pointing to Christ. I want us to think this week. I want us to think about what it would look like in our lives in every, if, if in every interaction we tried to decrease so that Christ could increase. If every time we looked for the opportunity to be smaller so that God can be seen better. Often we're jumping around, look at me, look at me. My life is so bad, do you feel sorry for me yet? I mean, my life is so good, look at my Instagram. I mean, we want eyes on us, and then when people are looking at us, we do, why are people looking at me? I just want to be left alone. But what if we made that conscious effort to step out of the limelight? In our actions, in our words, in our, in our deeds, to make it where people, they saw us, but what they saw in us made them look away from us. Made them look and say, I see something in you, and it's Jesus. The bigger we are, the harder it is for people to take their eyes off of us and focus on Jesus. In these verses, a splendid pattern of true and godly humility is shown. You see, the greatest saint in the eyes of God is the man who, as, as Peter said in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, is thoroughly clothed in humility. And it is this that brings us to our third point of a superior Jesus. In this final section of, of John chapter 3, verses 31 through 36, 
are the words of John the Apostle. So John the Baptist has finished talking when, in verse 30 when he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And in verse 31 it picks up with the reflections of the, the aging Apostle. Over the past roughly 70 years of ministry, since Jesus was lifted up on the cross and then ascended to the right hand of God. John has been thinking about the gospel, about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to serve God. And the Apostle John gives us three reasons for the greatness of Jesus. The first is in verse 31 when he reminds us of of Jesus' heavenly origin. And then in 32 through 34, the Apostle John tells us about the, the heavenly testimony of Christ. And then it ends with his heavenly authority in verses 35 through 36. Jesus' heavenly origins. You know, when we start to question if, if Scripture really is the best thing. Is it the best thing for us? Or is there other things that we look at? Question is, where do we view authority to come from? John points out that there's only one who is above all who came from heaven and is not limited by this earthly view. How many times do we open up our Bible, maybe we're reading, and we see something in it, and we do, oh, ooh, that's a little bit convicting. Uh, you know what, God, I've heard enough from you for today. Let me get a second opinion. Let me see what Dr. Phil has to say about how to deal with my problem. Oh, positive thoughts. Okay, you know, I like the positive thoughts more than the confession and the repentance. I'm going to try the positive thought. You know what? Let me call my friend. Hey, friend. Oh, I should just get over it. I like that one better, too. How often do we look around for someone who will say what we want them to say so we can have an excuse to reject the words of the one who came from heaven. Or do we accept the testimony of Jesus? Do we listen and obey to what Jesus said? You see, when we live obediently by the commands that, of Jesus, we will see that people will come to us. When we're living the way Jesus asked, the way he commanded, people will come and they will ask, where do you get that joy in your time of suffering? How do you have, how do you have peace in a time of chaos? How do you have hope when the world is dark? And we'll be able to tell them, because I listen to the words of the one who came from above. Amen. Verse 36, it says, The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. In Matthew 28, we see that God gave all authority to Jesus to his one and only Son. And that the only way to be saved from our sin is by believing in him, by putting our faith in him. Amen. You see, I think sometimes we can read through Scripture a little too fast. Maybe we've heard the verse before, so we just kind of gloss over it. But when we do that, we miss things. But I don't want us to miss something here in verse 36. 
I want you to notice, verse 36 does not say that the one who believes in the Son will have eternal life. If you don't believe me, look at it. Look at John 3.36. It doesn't say the one who believes will have eternal life. It says the one who believes, the one who placed their faith in Christ has eternal life. Has. Possess. I have this Bible in my hand. When was the last time that you, Christian, have thought of eternal life in that way? Something you, you have, you currently possess, and you do, I don't know about that. I don't feel like I have eternal life right now. I feel like I'm getting older. I feel like one day this will all end. Yes. But do you remember? Do you remember that time when you realized that you were a sinner in need of a Savior? Do you remember that time that someone, someone spoke the gospel to you and you said, I, I, I believe. I believe. It's at that moment that you stopped dying. It's at that moment that you possessed eternal life. Amen. The believer isn't supposed to look forward with a longing heart to some distant privilege of eternal life. You have it. As soon as you believe, you have it. You have pardon and peace and a complete title to heaven. All of these things are your, in your immediate possession. You see, they become the believer's own from the very moment you put your faith in Christ. Amen. I want you to think about that. Are you living a life longing for a future promise? Or are you living a life in the knowledge that you, that you currently possess life eternal? I think that will change the way we look at life, won't it? I saw this uh, motivational speaker or someone, and he was talking to, to, a, to two separate people, to a couple, and he said, if I promised you a million dollars tomorrow morning, I said, I will give you a million dollars tomorrow morning. What would, you, what would you do? Would you be happy or sad? I'd be, we'd be ha oh, my, we'd be happy, sad. Okay, what? If I said I'll give you $10 million, would you have anything to be sad about? Anything to be depressed about? Like, no. Would you be joyful? Oh, I'd be so happy. Oh, we would be happy. Okay, what if I said I'll give you the $10 million but the next day you would die. Would you take it? Well, no. So you want to, So you're saying that waking up the next morning is worth more than $10 million? They said, well, yeah. He said, then why don't you act like it? Why don't you act like it? Do you realize that if you're a believer, you have eternal life? then why don't we act like it? Why do we wake up every morning and not act like we're in possession of life eternal given as a free gift from God through His Son? Amen. One of the songs I really love is, is called Christ Our Glory. If you haven't listened to that song yet, hop on YouTube later. Christ Our Glory. One of the lines in the chorus says, Be still and remember the worst that can come, but shortens our journey and hastens us home. The worst that can come. Can you imagine that? We possess life eternal. If you're a believer, you possess life eternal. So no matter what happens throughout the day, the absolute worst thing that could happen 
gets you in front of Jesus that much faster. Won't that change your mindset? Won't that change the way you interact with people? The way you love people? The way when, when other people are, are rising and you're, you're falling? And you'll do, you know what? They're getting glory. Working it can happen to me. Hastens my journey home. When we live in that knowledge... That, that the worst the world can do gets us home faster, we can understand the words of Paul when he said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because with this outlook, knowing that we currently possess that eternal life, people cannot help but notice and when they ask, where does this joy come from? We can point them to Jesus. Let us seek in life and death to hold, this, to hold the same views of the Lord Jesus to which John here teaches us. You see, we can never make too much of Christ. We can never have too high thoughts about Christ. We can never love him too much or trust him too completely. We cannot lay too much weight on his shoulders. We cannot speak too highly of him or praise him too often. Because he is worthy of all honor and all praise and all glory. Amen. He will be all in heaven. But let us see to it that he is our all here on earth. Amen. As we leave this passage, let us hold on to this truth. If faith in Christ brings with it present and immediate privileges, that, that, that idea of to remain that when we believe in Christ, we, we possess that eternal life, then to remain in unbelief is to be in a state of tremendous peril. The greater the mercy of Jesus on others, the greater the guilt on those who reject it. We have to remember that the one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. If you have a decision you need to make today, then please, come.